A big welcome back to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast, Season 4, Episode Number 5. The Evidence-Based Hair Podcast was created for hair loss practitioners. It was created for practitioners around the world who care for patients with hair loss. Each week, I'll review a handful of different studies that are changing how we think about hair loss. I'll introduce them to you, help you make sense of them, and I'll give you my thoughts on how a given study just might be changing how we diagnose or treat hair loss. These are studies in androgenetic hair loss, alopecia areata, tinea capitis, telogen effluvium, trichotillomania, scarring alopecia, genetic disorders. The Evidence-Based Hair Podcast was created by the Donovan Hair Academy. This podcast was created to help all those who help all those with hair loss. It was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The third Monday of each month is dedicated to studies in scarring alopecia, and today it's my great pleasure to review five studies with you. For those of you who want a brief five to ten minute overview, a mini weekly podcast within our longer podcast. Well, we'll get to this in under one minute. For those of you who want a bit more detail in order to figure out how these various studies can be incorporated into your practice, well, you and I will dive into these studies together. My sincere thanks for joining me on this incredible journey. The references for all of these studies will be in the show notes that accompany this episode. So we'll begin with some fascinating work looking at the risk of hair loss with COVID vaccines in patients with scarring alopecia, a study by Flanagan and colleagues in the International Women's International Journal of Women's Dermatology. The authors of this really nice study surveyed patients that are part of the Cicatricial Alopecia Research Foundation, or CARF, which is now called the Scarring Alopecia Foundation. They surveyed a total of 317 members who had received mostly Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, and they surveyed them back in April 2021. 8% of patients developed hair loss. That's about 1 in 12. About half of those had mild hair loss, and half of those had moderate to severe hair loss after the vaccine. But overall, about 8% had hair loss. The survey didn't provide longitudinal evaluation, so we don't know all the long-term data, but some patients got their hair back, but not everyone got their hair back during the course of the survey. About 15% of patients had scalp symptoms. Again, roughly half were mild symptoms, but half were moderate to severe symptoms. And so we'll take a look at this really nice data together. I think it's a really important study, and I'm really grateful that this study has been published. I think this study is telling us that about 1 in 12 patients in our scarring alopecia group that get a vaccine are going to have hair loss. And so it's not zero, it's not 100%, but it's 8%, and we'll dive into this study together. So roughly 1 in 12 patients that you see with scarring alopecia that are getting vaccines will develop hair loss, and you and I can decide, you and I can chat whether you think this is mild risk, moderate risk, or significant risk. The authors here think the risk is quite low. Then we'll dive into a really nice study looking at the risk of progression of patients with discoid lupus onwards to systemic lupus. A really nice study by Fred Zhu in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, March 2023. You know, prior studies have suggested that the risk of progression from discoid lupus to systemic lupus is around 7%. But the data is quite varied depending on what study you want to look at. But the risk of progression to severe forms is around 7% based on the best studies we have to date. The authors here looked at what are some of the risk factors that you can use to predict a patient's chance of going onwards to severe forms of systemic lupus. These are forms that affect the heart, uh, require systemic therapy, affect the lungs, and uh, you know are really more significant. Well, there's three variables that are really, really important that they found in their multivariate analysis were really relevant. These are 
age under 25, darker colored skin, and an ANA of 1 in 320 or higher. And if you had none of those three, your risk of progression from discoid lupus to se severe systemic lupus was zero. And if you had all three of those, your risk was around 40%. If you had one, it was 6% or so. So we'll take a look at this really nice study. I think it's really important for us to have this data available. I see patients with discoid lupus. I'm sure that you do too. One of the worries with this word lupus is, are these patients with discoid lupus going to go on to develop systemic lupus? Well, some patients do go on to develop really mild changes that might fit the definition of systemic lupus, but they're really mild. They don't require systemic therapy, and they're not going to harm the patient. That's the most common scenario. And what we really want to understand as practitioners is, who are the patients sitting in the office with discoid lupus who are going to go on to develop more severe forms? Well, here we have three variables which you can immediately use in your practice. And I think this is a really nice study. Then we'll go on to look at a, another fascinating study by Mitzard in the British Journal of Dermatology from a few months ago, December 2022, looking at the risk of folliculitis decalvans in patients with dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, DEB. So epidermolysis bullosa is a rare genetic disorder associated with blistering. And there are a few types of epidermolysis bullosa, and the classification is based on where the blistering occurs in the skin. Now, for dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, the risk is around 2 to 6 in every 1 million live births, so it's pretty rare. It's due to a mutation in the collagen 7A gene. Now, the risk of folliculitis decalvans in the general population is maybe 1 in 15,000, maybe 1 in 20,000. Who really knows? But that's probably my best guess. What's the risk in patients with dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa? Well, the authors here suggest it's around 1 in 4, 25%. So we've gone from a risk of 1 in 15,000 to 1 in 4 in patients with DEB. Fascinating study, one of its kind. We don't have this data available, but I think this is really important. And the authors propose that some of the skin changes and scalp changes in DEB affect the skin microbiome and facilitate the development of folliculitis decalvans, and so we'll take a look at this really important study together. Then we'll go on to look at a study by Jenko in skin appendage disorders in January 2023. The authors describe a patient who developed dissecting cellulitis about two months after a hair transplant, and the hair transplant was conducted via follicular unit extraction, or FUE. And the patient came in 10 years later to these authors looking for medical assistance with a history of sinus tracts and lesions on the scalp which very closely resembled dissecting cellulitis and the pathology certainly fit the picture of dissecting cellulitis. So we'll take a look at this and you and I will talk about post-transplant hair complications. We'll just spend a few minutes. I have quite a large practice in patients that have experienced complications after hair transplant, and I think it's a fascinating area. Of course, hair, transplant goes, hair transplants go smoothly for a lot of patients, but they don't go smoothly for everybody. And here we have some complications in the donor area to take note of. We have dissecting cellulitis here. You can develop lichen plano pilaris. You can develop chronic folliculitis. You can develop uh, uh, pain disorders post-transplant. And a whole bunch of recipient area issues can occur, including folliculitis, scarring, alopecia, erosive pustular dermatosis, lichen plano pilaris, frontal fibrosing, alopecia, folliculitis, decalvans. And so we'll talk about this concept. I think this is a really nice study, putting dissecting cellulitis on the list as a complication post-transplant, probably a rare complication. And perhaps there are factors in this patient that predisposed to the development of dissecting cellulitis. We don't really know, but... We'll dive into this together. And then we'll take a look at a nice study by Caius Garcia in the JEADV 
in February 2023, looking at four new variants of dissecting cellulitis associated with furrows and gyri, mimicking cutis vertices gyrata. Cutis vertices gyrata, or CVG, is this scalp condition, frustrating scalp condition, and sometimes very emotionally disabling for some patients, associated with furrows and gyri, which mimic what the brain looks like. So you get these grooves, and it can be disfiguring, especially if a person has lost hair and has balding. Well, these authors here describe four variants of dissecting cellulitis that you may not have been aware of. And these variants have these furrows and gyri. And the first variant is a variant in a patient with uh, fibrotic, late-stage dissecting cellulitis, where the patient gets these furrows and grooves on the scalp that looks like CVG. The second is a form newly described by the authors, where a patient with chronic CVG, chronic cutis vertices gyrata, goes on to develop dissecting cellulitis over time. The third is a form where we have a patient with dissecting cellulitis, where it doesn't look like they have CVG when you stand over the scalp and look at them, but when you squeeze the scalp and apply pressure, you can see that the furrows and gyri of, of CVG develop around the dissecting cellulitis area. And the fourth is a variant where the patient has dissecting cellulitis, and when you apply pressure, the patient de develops these CVG-like folds all over the scalp. And it's only when you apply, apply pressure that you see that, and that's called the jacket sign. And so we'll take a look at these four variants of dissecting cellulitis that resemble CVG. I think this is really important. I think this is fascinating, and I can, I can say for sure that um, these presentations are something that you see way more common than you realize, because I can tell you now I see them way more common than I realize. And so I think this is really nice. I think it opens a whole new chapter in understanding some of these presentations of dissecting cellulitis. Dissecting cellulitis is a deep process. So in the early stages, it, it's happening way down there. And you get um, inflammation. You get nodules. You get hair loss. In the early stages, it mixes alopecia areata sometimes pretty closely. And it grows back with steroid injections in the early days. And so there are some patients with dissecting cellulitis, especially in the occipital area and crown, who it's so mild it grows back with steroid injections and you never hear from them again. But then there are these forms of dissecting cellulitis over time which develop these furrows and grooves and may never actually discharge pus and blood onto the scalp and so may never come to the attention of the clinician as being... Um, Typical dissecting cellulitis, where patients come in with pus, serosanguinous discharge, sinus tracts, and you can tell right away. So there may be these different forms. And I think what this really is encouraging us to think about in our basic scalp examination is to not only include a careful examination of the front and the top and the back and the eyebrows and the eyelashes and the body hair and the nails and the mouth and trichoscopy and a pull test maybe a pluck test, but maybe we should be applying pressure to the scalp and thinking about the laxity and hypermobility of the scalp a little more than we do. And so perhaps we should be gently squeezing and pushing and poking the scalp. And I think that's really relevant. You know, I think there's more to the clinical examination that we can do, and I think there's more valuable information that we can get. I certainly think artificial intelligence is really important. But I can say in the year 2023 that nothing yet outdoes um, a really good scalp examination. And this is really nice information, which reminds us that poking and prodding and pushing can allow us to see these grooves, can allow us to see these furrows in, in patients with various hair conditions. Um, and here we can apply it to evaluating dissecting cellulitis. So we'll take a look at this study. I really, really like this study. JEADV, February 2023.
some new variants of dissecting cellulitis mimicking CVG. The references for all these are in the show notes that accompany the episode. So let's begin then, Flanagan and colleagues in the International Journal of Women's Dermatology. My colleagues, Dr. Senna, Dr. Bergfeld, and other wonderful colleagues that are part of the Scarring Alopecia Foundation are on this paper. Title, COVID-19 Vaccination Among Patients with Cicatricial Alopecia, Patient Concerns, Experiences, and Treatment Modification. So let's dive in. COVID vaccines have had a really important role in reducing morbidity and mortality. They do have side effects. And there's a number of side effects that are really relevant to the hair specialist. COVID vaccines can cause telogen effluvium. They can cause telogen effluvium, which accelerates androgenetic hair loss. They can cause alopecia areata. They can cause scalp dysesthesia. What about scarring alopecia? Well, you and I have reviewed on prior episodes that maybe in some patients with pre-existing scarring alopecia, there can be flares. But this data really hasn't been well studied. And so Flanagan and colleagues produce a very nice study, a survey-based study, where they set out to evaluate the concerns of patients with scarring alopecia and how they responded to vaccines and whether they had to alter their treatment plan due to the vaccine or had to alter their treatment plan as a result of receiving their vaccine. So it was a survey that was sent to the 5,000 or so members of the Scarring Alopecia Foundation back in April 2021. Respondents were 18 years of age or over and had scarring alopecia. About 969 members clicked on the link and said, what is this? And about 317 members took the time to fill out the survey. 32% of the people that clicked on the survey. But a lot of patients, of course, chose to ignore the survey altogether. But nevertheless, we have data on 317 participants. Average age was 60 years. 95% were female. 74% were white. LPP, FFA, and CCCA were the most common scarring alopecias that were evaluated. 94% of the participants had one dose or more of the vaccine. Remember, this is back in April 2021, and vaccines came out roughly December 2020. Most patients had the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Some had J&J, some had AstraZeneca, but it was a very low proportion. Patients had common side effects like fatigue, injection site reactions, fever, and two of the 317 patients had hospitalization as as a result of a vaccine reaction. Here's what I'd like you to know. 8% of patients felt the vaccine caused hair loss. That's 1 in 12. And of those patients that had hair loss, half had mild hair loss, half had moderate to severe hair loss. The actual numbers are 56% of those that had hair loss felt it was mild, and 44% felt it was moderate or severe. But 8% of people receiving the COVID vaccine who had scarring alopecia had hair loss. Now, this survey was done April 2021, so most patients had received their vaccine only recently, in the last few months. 36% of patients who had hair loss felt they got their hair back. But the survey didn't go on long enough to really evaluate if everybody got their hair back. So we don't really know. But we know that some patients got their hair back, which we would expect. But we don't know if everyone got their hair back. And that's a really important message we'll come to in a minute. So 8% had hair loss. 15% of patients felt the vaccine caused scalp symptoms, worsening of their symptoms. So that's 1 in 7. 1 in 7 patients with scarring alopecia that get a vaccine feel that their scalp feels worse. In half of patients, the symptoms were mild. But look at this. In half of patients, the symptoms were moderate to severe after the vaccine. 
And again, many patients felt that the symptoms improved over time. 37% of patients, uh, 60 or so percent of patients felt the symptoms improved, but 37% of patients felt that their symptoms hadn't improved at the time the survey was done. And again, it's not a longitudinal survey, so we don't have patients being followed for, you know, 12 months or two years or five years. These are patients that are answering a survey in April 2021, when the world is still very much in um, you know, social isolation and revised uh, protocols for businesses and socialization. And so most patients here had just received their vaccines. So it's not a long-term study. But 12% of patients needed to have their medications adjusted due to the vaccine. In 5% of participants, there was an alteration in the treatment plan. 3.2% stopped or paused systemic treatment, like hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, doxycycline, mycophenolate. We don't know in this study how many patients were actually on systemic therapy to make sense of this, but we know that some patients need to stop therapy for a week or two after receiving a vaccine. That was the recommendation at the time. If you're on methotrexate, if you're on um, mycophenolate, if you're on certain types of immunosuppressant, perhaps you should stop your immunosuppressant for up to two weeks to enhance the vaccine response. But again, we don't really know how many patients were on systemic therapy in this survey to really make sense of the data. But 12% of patients who noted worsening of hair loss and 10% who noted worsening of scalp symptoms had to alter their treatment in some way. So this is a really valuable study. And I appreciate this study very much. Flanagan and colleagues, 2023. There's limitations to this study. Of course, survey-based studies always have limitations. This survey was sent to 5,000 patients and only 317 took the time to fill it out. 900 clicked the link saying, well, this looks interesting. Well, what is the Scarring Alopecia Foundation asking me to do? But only 30% went ahead and filled out the survey. So there's a bias here. Certain patients are really motivated to do these surveys. Why is that? Well, we don't know. But that's a limitation of all survey-based studies. Are these patients that are more likely to have side effects? If you receive an email that says there's a survey about COVID vaccines and you're sitting there, you know, talking to your family member about your hair loss after the vaccine, well, you might be more likely to click on the survey and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this survey. So there, there can be bias. But nevertheless, it's a, a really helpful study. We also don't know if the hair loss that patients experienced would fit the definitions of mild, moderate, or severe based on the formal definitions. Patients click a box that says their hair loss is mild, or they click a box that says it's moderate, or they click a box that says it's severe. And we know that patients sometimes rate hair loss differently than clinicians do based on formal clinical studies. But nevertheless, this data is really, really important. 8% of patients have hair loss, and 50% of those patients feel it's moderate to severe hair loss. And again, this is a short duration study. This is April 2021 that this survey was done. Patients had just received COVID vaccines. They just came out in December, four months or five months before that. And so this is pretty short duration. The authors conclude Quote, based on our survey study results, physicians can reassure cicatricial alopecia patients about the low risk of worsened scarring alopecia due to COVID-19 vaccination. I think I generally agree with that, but I don't think I have the same positive feelings as the authors. I don't think we can conclude such great feelings of positivity based on this study. We just don't have the long-term data. We have 60% of patients in this study saying, I got my hair back. But there's 40% of patients that didn't feel they got their hair back. Now, the survey wasn't long enough, and the, and the study wasn't designed to really study longitudinal data. But there's a whole host of patients in this survey that are saying, I didn't get my hair back yet. 
contact me in a month or two or three or five and ask me, but I didn't get my hair back yet. So we can't ignore those patients. So we don't really know that everyone gets their hair back. We don't really know that everyone's symptoms resolve. Most patient symptoms resolved in this study, but the data is not long enough. We need to make sure that everyone is accounted for in the world of uh, hair loss and vaccines. And so does everyone get their hair back? Does everyone's symptoms resolve? I'm certainly of the view that vaccines show pretty good safety for most people. And I'm certainly of the belief that we've not had to say goodbye to as many family members and friends and colleagues as we would have otherwise if we didn't have these vaccines. That's pretty clear. But I certainly deal with COVID vaccine side effects every day in my practice. And that ranges from uh, precipitation of alopecia areata, that ranges from uh, hair shedding disorders, that ranges from scalp dysesthesias or scalp symptoms. And the key point of this study is that 1 in 12 patients with scarring alopecia who roll up their sleeves to get a vaccine are going to have hair loss. That's a pretty big number. And absolutely, for many patients, that's a side effect that's worth it for them. But I think this data is really valuable because it tells us that if you want to say to your patient, at least with scarring alopecia, yeah, go ahead and have a vaccine, you'll be fine. That's really not the right approach. The approach is you may consider having a vaccine if you feel the risks and the benefits are worth it for you, and they very well may be, but you have an 8% chance of hair loss. And if you get hair loss, well, there's a 50-50 chance it's going to be real moderate to severe. That's the data we have. So I'm not sure we call it a low number. Uh, I think we call it good outcomes for most, but we don't have the long-term data. And so if we're going to have COVID vaccines every year, as they're proposing, just like the influenza vaccine, and we're going to have eight percent of patients every year shedding for anywhere from one to five months, six months, and half of those patients having moderate to severe shedding, what is one to do? I think that's the real question. I think that's the real issue. And I think that's the real need is to develop strategies to overcome this shedding. I think if we turn our backs and say, risks are low, patients do great, roll up your sleeves, get the vaccine. Hair issues are minor. That's not the right approach. Um, and the patients who come in my office with all of these concerns about their hair after vaccines would, would agree that there's a whole host of issues that we haven't yet really resolved. And so there's going to be patients out there that spend as many days shedding as they do not shedding in the world of COVID vaccines. It's a small number, but I think we need to address that. We need long-term data. We need to really understand what happens to patients after COVID vaccines long-term. We know the data is really, really good for most, but we're not in a field to deal with the most common group of patients. We're in a field to make sure we have everyone accounted for. And that's really the message of this study. Let's make sure we know what happens with everybody. So what do I tell patients when someone phones and says, I got my vaccine last month. I have hair loss, doc. Well, you have a 50% chance it's mild, 50% chance it's moderate to severe. And that doesn't sit well with me. I don't feel super calm, and I don't think I feel as calm as these authors. And if when the patient says to me next, is it all going to grow back? I, I'm okay with hair loss. Is it all going to grow back? Well, I think we can say for most patients it's going to grow back but I don't think we have all the long-term data yet. We know that there are some patients that the vaccines precipitate alopecia areata and some severe. It's a very mild, it's a very minor number. But there are some patients that are not going to get their hair back. It's a very low risk. So I don't think that should be overstated or taken the wrong way, but there are patients that are not going to get their hair back. What about patients with scarring alopecia? Is everyone getting their hair back? I don't think we have that data yet. I think most will, but we don't have that long-term data. So we need to follow that. And I think the Scarring Alopecia Foundation is 
And the patients in the, in the organization are so wonderful and so motivated that a follow-up study could be done to really better understand these 317 patients and whether everyone did get their hair back and how they're doing. So I think longitudinal data could be easily accessed in this study. But I thank the authors for this wonderful study. Check it out. It's free online. And I thank all the patients that have participated in this study and given of their time. I think it's really valuable information. Let's take a look at a really nice study looking at the risk of progression from discoid lupus to systemic lupus, a study in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, March 2023. Discoid lupus is a condition which can affect the scalp, but it can affect the skin as well and cause scarring alopecia. Patients with scalp discoid lupus present with uh, areas of hair loss, sometimes closely mimicking lichen plano pilaris. Trichoscopy shows follicular plugging, shows um, follicular red dots, and shows changes in pigmentation, lighter and darker areas. And so there can be very specific features of discoid lupus which allow you to differentiate it from lichen plano pilaris. But when you see a patient with discoid lupus, one of the key things is understanding the risk that that patient will progress to develop Systemic lupus erythematosus. Discoid lupus can be disfiguring. It can cause itching and burning and pain. It can cause areas of permanent hair loss. It can cause scarring on the face. But patients with discoid lupus themselves are often very healthy and do not have systemic concerns. They do not have a risk of, uh, they do not have a worry about kidney damage or lung damage or heart damage for most. But some patients do progress to systemic lupus. And the data to date suggests that about 7% of patients with discoid lupus can progress to a more severe form of systemic lupus, can progress to a form which does involve multiple organs of the body. But upwards of 20% or more can perhaps progress in some studies to very mild forms of systemic lupus that meet the formal criteria for systemic lupus. But about three, four, five, six, seven percent of patients will go on to a more severe form of systemic lupus. What are the factors that are associated with progression from discoid lupus on to systemic lupus? Well, they've been studied for many years and they include features like widespread discoid lesions, arthralgias, joint pains, nail changes, anemia, reduced red cell counts, leukopenia, reduced white cell counts, high ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rates, and high titers of antinuclear antibodies, the ANA. So those are factors which are associated with progression onwards to various forms of systemic lupus. But what are the factors associated with progression to severe forms? Patients that will require systemic immunosuppressions, patients that are at risk for severe kidney disease or heart disease or lung disease, and even death. That's what's really important, is understanding the proportion of patients that will develop severe systemic lupus. And a 2014 study suggested that about 7% of patients will go on to develop moderate to severe lupus. And this was a study by Dr. Worth's group published in JAMA Dermatology 2020, 2014, and it's a commonly quoted study titled Systemic Symptoms in the Progression of Cutaneous to Systemic Lupus Erythematosus. So about 7% of patients with discoid lupus go on to develop severe systemic lupus, moderate to severe systemic lupus. So here we have a study by Fridjou and colleagues looking at the risk of progression from discoid lupus to systemic lupus, and what are the risk factors? There's a number of definitions in this study. They have patients with discoid lesions, number one. Patients with discoid lupus with mild biological SLE, and DLE with mild biological SLE is defined as patients that have DLE but also have at least 10 points in the new 2019 ACR ULR criteria. So they have DLE lesions and they have some other 
blood test abnormality like leukopenia, low C3, C4, autoantibodies, but they don't require treatment, systemic immunotherapies, and they're otherwise fairly healthy. That's called mild biological SLE. In this study, severe SLE was defined as one of the following features, SLE fever, pericarditis or a pleural effusion, so heart and lung involvement, lupus nephritis, so the kidney being involved, the brain being involved with neuropsychiatric manifestations, autoimmune hemolysis, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, or the need for systemic immunosuppressants or hospitalization. So that's severe SLE. And so if you're not familiar with the new 2019 ACR ULR criteria, check it out. If you have an ANA of more than 1 in 80, then you can go on to look at these criteria and you need a clinical criteria to be positive and then you need 10 or more points to be classified as having systemic lupus erythematosus. And so the new criteria allow the clinician to evaluate whether there's fever, whether there's hematologic changes, whether there's neuropsychiatric changes, mucocutaneous changes, which include non-scarring alopecia, oral ulcers, discoid lupus, subcutaneous lupus, and acute lupus rashes, pleural effusions, pericarditis, joint involvements, renal changes, and all these autoantibodies, low C3, C4, anti-double-stranded DNA, and anti-Smith. And so you get various points for whether those are positive or not, and if you have 10 or more points, and one of the clinical criteria with the positive ANA of at least 1 in 80, then you can be classifying the patient as having systemic lupus. So those are the new criteria. Do check them out. They're widely available online. And so in this study, the authors set out to include patients in the study that had discoid lupus. And at baseline, 52% of patients in the study had discoid lupus only, and 48% of patients had discoid lupus with mild SLE. And in total, there was 30 patients who went on to develop severe SLE, and 134 patients who did not. And these patients were more often women. The mean follow-up Median follow-up was about 12 years. And in multivariate analysis, there were three factors associated with the progression from DLE, discoid lupus, to severe SLE. That was an age less than 25, darker skin types, phototype 4, 5 and 6, and an antinuclear antibody titer of 1 in 320 or more. And so if you were less than 25, you were given one point. If you had a darker skin type, you got one point. And if you had an ANA of more than uh, 1 in 320 or more, you had five points. And so if you had none of those three, in other words, a score of zero at baseline, your chances of progression, progression to severe SLE was zero. If you had all of those three factors, so a score of seven, age less than 25, darker skin type, and an ANA of 1 in 320 or more, you had a 50% chance of progression to severe SLE. And then everything with scores in between had percent chances in between. So if you had a score of 1, you had a 6% chance of progressing to severe SLE. If you had a score of um, 5 or 6, your risk of progression to SLE was slightly more. But this scoring system provided a means of assessing patients' risk. So a really nice study which gives numbers to better understand the risk of progression from discoid lupus to severe SLE. The reason this study is so important is we're not just looking at the risk of progression to SLE that meets the definition of SLE. There are many patients that progress from discoid lupus to SLE, but it's mild SLE. They have discoid lesions on the scalp or the face, and they have changes in C3 or C4 and some other hematologic change, and they never go on to develop any illness, and they are healthy otherwise. That patient does have lupus, but they are not at risk for these severe manifestations. They are not at risk 
for the kidney damage, the serositis, the lung involvement, the joint involvement. But these three factors are relevant to the risk of going on to severe SLE. So the authors point out that these three criteria can be used quite readily to predict the risk, and we can reassure patients with discoid lupus with a score of zero or one that their risks are very, very low. They're unlikely to progress. So I think that's really important. So we move on to another very nice study by Matard and colleagues in the British Journal of Dermatology from a couple of months ago, BJD, December 2022, titled Folliculitis Decalvans and Dystrophic Epidermolysis Bullosa, colon, a significant association. And it sure is a significant association. We'll take a look at this study together. So the authors described 30 cases of scarring alopecia, folliculitis decalvans, that were associated with dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. And they suggest a link between these two conditions being greatest for recessive dystrophic EB as opposed to dominant dystrophic EB, but nevertheless risks for both. So what is epidermolysis bullosa? Well, you may not have heard about it because it's rare. It's an inherited genetic blistering disease whereby patients develop blisters from mechanical stress and these blisters can develop in the early days of life. There are four classes of epidermolysis bullosa based on where tissue separates, where these blistering issues are forming. So there's EB simplex, junctional EB, dystrophic EB, and Kindler. And as you go deeper and deeper in the skin where the, where the blistering occurs, the more likely you are to have permanent scarring and um, disfiguring. So dystrophic EB is one of those types of EB. It affects the skin and the nails, and it's usually present at birth. And dystrophic EB accounts for about two to six per million live births. So it's rare, but it does occur. The prevalence is similar in males and females, and it's due to a mutation in type 7 collagen, the gene COL7A1. There's 14 subtypes of dystrophic EB, and there's over 400 mutations in collagen 7A that have been identified. In mild cases, it can affect the hands and the feet, the knees and the elbows. In severe cases, it can cause widespread blistering that can lead to vision loss, disfigurement, changes in the esophagus, and serious medical issues. Recessive dystrophic EB is characterized by skin fragility, wounds, scarring, and the main findings in severe generalized recessive dystrophic EB include skin fragility with minimal trauma. It can heal with milia and scarring. Blisters and erosions can affect the entire body and present in the neonatal period. It can involve the mouth, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, lead to reduction in the size of the oral cavity on account of that scarring. You can have esophageal erosions and webbing, which affects swallowing and can lead to dysphagia. It can lead to nutrient deficiencies. And these are really important issues in the neonatal childhood age groups to make sure that these children with uh, dystrophic EB are well-nourished so that they can grow. It can affect the eyes, lead to vision loss due to the scarring. It can lead to contractures in the hands and the feet. And the lifetime risk of skin cancer is extremely high, over 90%. And that can include very aggressive forms of squamous cell carcinoma. And so these patients need to be very closely followed by um, the dermatologists. There are less severe forms of recessive dystrophic EB that are localized to the hands and the feet, and patients have less mutilating type scarring than can be seen in the more severe forms. And so it's important to appreciate that this, there's a wide spectrum of dystrophic EB that occurs, and some of this is due to the wide variety of mutations that occur in the collagen 7A gene. And in dominant dystrophic EB, the blistering is often mild and it's less severe in its phenotype than the recessive dystrophic EB form. But nevertheless, it does heal with scarring as well. And sometimes in dominant dystrophic EB, changes in the nails, loss of toenails, uh, can be the only manifestation of dominant dystrophic EB. But we need to suspect 
dystrophic EB, when there's the skin fragility, when there's blisters that happen with minimal trauma, when these changes are occurring in the neonatal period, when there's blistering and erosions affecting multiple parts of the body, not only the skin, but the mouth and the esophagus, when there's dystrophic or absent nails, especially the toenails, and when there's a family inheritance. And genetic testing can be done to look for the specific mutation in the collagen 7 gene, COL7A gene. And so genetic testing is often done to confirm this diagnosis where available worldwide. There are other techniques with histology and immunofluorescence in some areas of the world where genetic testing is not possible. We don't have a cure yet for epidermolysis bullosa. Treatment is symptomatic. And that includes reducing trauma, treating wounds, treating infections, helping with nutrition, preventing scar formation, monitoring for skin cancer, aggressively treating skin cancers when they occur, and supporting the psychologic profile of the patient. Because this, of course, can be devastating. Some patients have such deformities in their hands and feet that it's not possible to use the hands and feet. Patients can't walk. Patients can't use their hands because they've had um, such dystrophic scarring that the um, fingers may uh, fuse. But this study looked at this association between uh, dystrophic EB and folliculitis decalvans. And it's a, a really a one-of-a-kind study. So the authors reviewed 243 patients with EB in their EB clinics. These are two French centers that specialize in EB. They looked at their data over the period 2010 to 2021. They had 69 patients with EB simplex, 31 patients with junctional EB, 35 patients with dominant dystrophic EB, and 108 patients with recessive dystrophic EB. Folliculitis decalvans was found in 28% of patients with recessive dystrophic EB and 10% of patients with dominant dystrophic EB, but it wasn't found in EB simplex or junctional EB. There's something very special about dystrophic EB and the risk of folliculitis decalvans. There were no children with folliculitis decalvans, um, meaning that the folliculitis decalvans developed after puberty or in adults. But nevertheless, 24% of patients with dystrophic EB had folliculitis decalvans. Most of these patients were female. It's a really interesting link. It's not clear why this occurs. But if you look at the risk of folliculitis decalvans in the general population, you'll come to see why I'm so fascinated by this report. The risk of folliculitis decalvans in the general population is probably 1 in 15,000. It may be 1 in 20,000 or 1 in 25,000. It's pretty rare. But the risk of folliculitis decalvans in dystrophic EB is 1 in 4. So not 1 in 15,000, but at 1 in 4. The folliculitis decalvans here is more likely to occur in female patients. That's unexpected because folliculitis decalvans tends to occur more in males. And dystrophic EB is equally common in males and females. So there's something unique here about the development of folliculitis decalvans in female patients. And the reasons aren't clear. The authors propose that mechanical stress from hairstyling leads to traction, but that's just a best guess. It's not clear why. There's changes in skin fragility and changes in the microbiome that result from the blistering that occurs that predisposes to an altered skin microbiome that leads to the development of folliculitis decalvans. All these are really best guesses. We don't know fully why patients with dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa develop folliculitis decalvans so readily, one in four. And so more studies are needed. More studies are needed to better understand how to reduce the chances that patients with dystrophic EB go on to develop folliculitis decalvans. How do we provide wound care to the scalp? How can we use antimicrobial, antimicrobial agents properly so that we can reduce microbiome alterations? How can we facilitate the development of a healthy microbiome so that patients don't go on to develop folliculitis decalvans? I think certainly this is a population where those studies can readily be done to really understand the microbiome. 
And I think someday we'll get there. I think someday we'll really understand how we can keep good bugs on the scalp, keep good bacteria on the scalp, keep good yeast on the scalp to facilitate a healthy microbiome so that we can reduce the chances of progression to uh, folliculitis de Calvins. And this may be a patient population where some of those studies can really be done. But the chances of folliculitis de Calvins in this group is one in four. That's really, really high. And this center and many centers across the world have EB centers. And this may be the centers where these studies can, can be done to really understand how we can reduce the risk of progression to folliculitis de Calvins. And I thank the authors for this study. We move on to a study now looking at the development of dissecting cellulitis in the donor area of a patient that had a hair transplant. This is a study from January 2023 in Skin Appendage Disorders titled Perifolliculitis Capitis Obsedens and Sophodians After Follicular Unit Transplantation. What in the world is Perifolliculitis Capitis Obsedens and Sophodians? Well, it's another term for dissecting cellulitis. And the full term is Perifolliculitis Capitis Obsedens and Sophodians of Hoffman. I very rarely use that term in my clinic because it takes too long to write. The term that I use is dissecting cellulitis. So these authors from Italy report a case of dissecting cellulitis after follicular unit hair transplantation. This patient came to the author's attention 10 years after having a hair transplant. And these nodulocystic lesions in the donor area, that's the area at the back of the scalp where hairs were extracted from in the hair transplant, these lesions developed about two months after the patient had the hair transplant. And the patient had no history prior to that of any type of folliculitis. And the patient presents with fluctuating cysts, communicating with, other, with each other with fistulas and sinus tracts, draining pus and blood. And the patient had intense pain. The patient repeatedly had these lesions excised and continued to develop new lesions and presented for attention to these authors for help 10 years after the transplant. An examination by the authors showed numerous cysts with scarring in the donor area and a biopsy had features of dissecting cellulitis. So the authors here speculate that somehow during extraction of the follicular units, there was a triggering of dissecting cellulitis. And the reasons aren't clear, but the authors propose that somehow there's an alteration in skin microbiota, and perhaps there's a predisposition to follicular occlusion that somehow leads to the development of dissecting cellulitis in this patient. But it's not clear, but the authors present this paper to draw on the hair transplant community and the hair loss community to make note of this. And perhaps there are more cases that we are missing. I really like this study. It adds to the list of issues that can occur post-op. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there's a whole host of issues that can occur post-op. Most patients do great after hair transplantation, but certainly I see lots of patients with complications post-transplant. And we can think about those complications in terms of the donor area and the recipient area. The donor area is the area where the hairs are taken. It's usually the back of the scalp. And patients can develop a chronic folliculitis. They can develop chronic pain syndromes. They can develop lichen plano pilaris. They can develop dissecting cellulitis, as this study points out. And there's a whole host of issues as well in the recipient area. And for most people, that's the front of the scalp or the middle or the crown where the new hairs are going. Patients can develop chronic folliculitis. They can develop folliculitis decalvans. They can develop LPP, FFA. So there's a whole host of issues that can develop in the recipient area as well. But this paper reminds us that perhaps we need to add dissecting cellulitis to the list of donor area complications that can develop post-op. I really like this study. I thought it was, was interesting. I think that the evidence is at least convincing enough that it seems to be a dissecting cellulitis-like presentation developing after transplant. I certainly wonder in this study, and I didn't seem to see any data for it, but you know, is there any evidence that this patient has hydradenitis separativa or boils in the armpits or the groin? 
Is there any evidence of pyelonidal cysts? Not sure if the patient was examined, but most likely the patient was, and it, it wasn't reported, but it sure would be interesting. Is there some kind of predisposition? Did this patient have a very severe form of acne in the childhood or adolescent years or young adult years? Does the patient have acne form lesions on the um, scalp, uh, on the chest, that would be suggestive of uh, a form of acne conglobata? Is there some predisposition here in this patient? We didn't get enough information in this study, but the suggestion is there's not. The patient was healthy. The thing I always think about when I see referrals for dissecting cellulitis is dissecting cellulitis is a mimicker. Everything's a mimicker. Alopecia areata has mimickers. Androgenetic hair loss has mimickers. But dissecting cellulitis has mimickers. And so when I see a patient with dissecting cellulitis, I ask myself, could this be tinea capitis? Could this be a chronic infection? Could this be uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? Could this be a deep fungal infection? And so when you have challenging cases of dissecting cellulitis, these biopsies are really important, and the authors performed a biopsy. Sometimes it's helpful to culture it. You take your tissue and you send it off in saline for a culture for deep fungal atypical, microbi atypical microbacteria. And you phone up your uh, ID colleagues and your lab and you say, listen, I've got this specimen coming. And sometimes you take a big chunk. You take a four millimeter, five millimeter, six millimeter biopsy. And you cut it in half and you put it in different media, depending on what your, your microbiology lab tells you. But you say, listen, I have this really complex patient. I, I'm, I need you to culture for bacteria and atypical bacteria and fungi and and your microbiology colleagues will put it in different media to try to grow up different organisms. So sometimes that's important. So in atypical dissecting cellulitis cases, you really want to be thinking about tinea capitis, lymphoma, and unusual infections. But nevertheless, I think this is a great study. I think the authors presented quite convincingly that it sounds like dissecting cellulitis developing in the donor area. And I think this is important. How common is this? We don't know. This is not a common presentation, but uh, I certainly think that um, some issues like scarring alopecia, pain syndromes, like plano pilaris are, are more common than we realize. And finally, report number five for this week is a study by Caius Garcia, Distinct presentations of scalp dissecting cellulitis manifesting with furrows and gyri, published in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology, February 2023. I really, really liked this study. This study will change my practice, and it may change yours. Let's walk through it. These authors present new presentations of dissecting cellulitis, new ways that dissecting cellulitis can show up in clinic that we need to be aware of. We usually think of dissecting cellulitis as patients that come in with nodules and sinus tracts, and when they come in, they're discharging pus or blood, and sometimes there's an odor to the room. That's the typical presentation. But what about other variations? Well, that's one of the focuses of today. The focus here is that some patients with dissecting cellulitis have ridges and furrows that can mimic cutis vertices gyrata. So a typical patient with dissecting cellulitis has nodules, drainage of pus. Often this pus, when you culture it, is negative for bacteria. We call that a sterile culture. In the early stages, it can look just like alopecia areata. You see areas of hair loss with fine vellus hairs. It may not have broken the skin to cause the discharge yet. And what is cutis vertices gyrata? Well, cutis vertices gyrata is a different condition altogether, whereby patients develop ridges and furrows in the scalp. And these furrows are shown here by the arrows. The ridges are shown adjacent to the furrows. 
And cutis vertices gyrata can sometimes be mild. And if a patient has good hair density, they can cover it. And some patients never know they have cutis vertices, cutis vertices gyrata. There's many patients I see that um, aren't aware that they have any furrows or ridges in the scalp because it's so mild. But for some patients, it's quite disabling, especially if there's balding. These ridges and furrows can be readily seen when a patient um, takes off the hat, for example. And it's called cutis, cutis vertices gyrata because it resembles the structure of the brain with these folds and furrows. And so the authors here in this 2023 study describe four distinct presentations of dissecting cellulitis that involve furrows and gyri. Let me walk you through these variants, and then we'll talk about them. The first is a variant of dissecting cellulitis, which mimics cutis vertices gyrata. The second is the development of dissecting cellulitis in a patient with long-standing cutis vertices gyrata. So some patients with CVG can develop dissecting cellulitis, never before being uncovered. The third is a form where patients can have dissecting cellulitis. It doesn't look like they have CVG, but when you apply pressure to the scalp, you see that they get these folds and furrows and, and gyri in the area of the dissecting cellulitis. The fourth is a patient that has dissecting cellulitis, and it doesn't look like they have CVG, but when you apply pressure to the scalp, you see these folds and furrows and gyri that develop all across the scalp with pressure. And so let's take a look at these. So to understand this, we really need to understand CVG a bit more. And CVG is classified into primary and secondary forms. And the primary forms themselves have two forms called essential and non-essential. So we have these three forms of cutis vertices gyrata. Primary essential CVG, primary non-essential CVG, and then secondary CVG. So there's an article on the website that can walk you through this in more detail if you're interested. I'll put the link in the show notes. But essentially in patients with primary idiopathic CVG called primary essential CVG, there's just abnormalities in the folds of the scalp. There's no other abnormalities with the nervous system or the eyes or development. With primary non-essential CVG, there's some underlying association. Could be neurologic disease, could be eye disease, could be chromosomal disease. And so often, when you see a patient with cutis vertices gyrata, you need a good history to understand, is there any possibility of some underlying neurologic disease, eye disease, hearing disorders, chromosomal abnormalities? So you need really good histories in patients with CVG. And then there's secondary CVG. Secondary CVG means that the skin disease itself is leading to a change in the skin such that you get these folds and it's the underlying disease itself that's causing this CVG-like presentation. And if you treat that disease, sometimes you can stop the folds from forming or improve it. And there's a long list of skin diseases, endocrine diseases that can lead to these folds. And that includes psoriasis, impetigo, atopic dermatitis, dissecting cellulitis has been described in the past by authors as well as acromegaly, insulin resistance, pituitary tumors, certain types of cancers, use of anabolic steroids. These are secondary CVG. These are the conditions that are causing the scalp to fold. If you treat those conditions, you can sometimes reduce or stop the formation of the folds gyri. With the primary non-essential CVG, there's these underlying disorders like neurologic disease or eye disease, and those occur separately. 
So if you treat the neurologic disease, you don't have an impact on the skin CVG. If you treat the eye cataract or blindness or etc., you don't have any impact on the skin folds and gyri. So it's only in secondary CVG that if you treat the underlying disorder, you get an impact on the um, folds that are forming in the scalp. And so dissecting cellulitis has been described before. A study in October 2021 by Mohammed and colleagues titled Cutis Vertices Gyrata and Quality of Life, Clinical Report of 13 Cases in the Egyptian Journal of Hospital Medicine, described a patient with dissecting cellulitis who developed secondary CVG. So it's not the first time that has been described. But the authors here describe four different presentations of dissecting cellulitis involving folds and furrows and gyri. And let's take a look at this. So variant one is a patient with dissecting cellulitis who is in the final stages of destruction of uh, hair follicles and sebaceous glands, and they have scarring alopecia. And on account of all that scarring that's developing, they develop folds in the scalp that resemble CVG. It tends to be asymmetric, so more towards one side of the scalp and more random. And so if we think about this pictorially, a patient has dissecting cellulitis, and then over time, they develop these folds and furrows and gyri, specifically in the area of dissecting cellulitis. In the second variant, a patient has long-standing CVG and then develops dissecting cellulitis. So the author provides an example of a patient with primary CVG. So they've had these folds, furrows, gyri for a long time, and then they go on to develop dissecting cellulitis. This presentation has never been described before, so this is new. And the authors propose that Somehow the CVG predisposes the skin to trauma and changes in microbiome and inflammation that somehow trigger dissecting cellulitis. And so if we think about this pictorially, we have a patient with long-standing CVG who then develops dissecting cellulitis in areas of the CVG. The third variant is a patient with dissecting cellulitis who when you look at the scalp, it doesn't look like they have CVG. But when you apply pressure, you see that these folds and furrows and gyri form, and that's called the jacket sign. So the authors point out that in some cases, you can actually see these folds and furrows when you put pressure on the scalp. And that's the jacket sign or the fold sign. And here you see the folds in the area of the dissecting cellulitis. And the jacket sign or the fold sign has been proposed to be due to an absence of hair follicles in that area. And so when hair follicles are missing and you put pressure on the skin, the skin collapses in that area. And so if we think about this pictorially, we have dissecting cellulitis on the scalp. You apply pressure and you get a fold in the area of the dissecting cellulitis. That is a positive fold sign or jacket sign. In the fourth variant, we have a patient with dissecting cellulitis, who when you look at the scalp, you'd never think about CVG, but when you apply pressure to the scalp, you get the folds of of CVG all across the scalp. And so the authors point out that this is a type of dissecting cellulitis where there's extreme hypermobility and laxity of tissues. And you may not see it when you examine the scalp, but when you put pressure, you get a positive jacket sign or fold sign. And the authors propose that maybe this is the interconnectedness of lesions. Maybe these are some of the early sinus tracts that are forming. And so again, if we think about this pictorially, you have a patient with dissecting cellulitis, and when you put pressure, you get the folds forming all over the scalp, mimicking CVG. So there's these four presentations of dissecting cellulitis that mimic CVG. 
And the authors point this out because this may help prevent misdiagnosis. I think this is really, really important. I really like this study because I am a big believer that there are some patients with CVG who really have secondary CVG, that it looks like CVG, but it's due to an inflammatory condition in the scalp that's predisposing to the formation of these gyri and folds and furrows. And there are some patients with CVG when it's asymmetric that do really well with aggressive treatment of inflammation, whether that's steroid injections or local steroids. I'm not talking here about patients with symmetrical CVG or CVG since childhood and adolescence, where it occurs across all the scalp and their classic furrows and gyri, but patients with asymmetrical CVG. Many of these patients have have inflammatory disorders that are causing a secondary form of CVG. And so I really like this study. I think that it reminds us that when you see a patient with CVG, that you need to first assess, is this primary or secondary? Is this essential CVG or non-essential CVG? Is this associated with neurological disease? eye disease, hearing disorders, chromosomal abnormality, so you need a good history. And is there any evidence that this is secondary to some other disorder, that the folds and the furrows in the scalp are, are occurring because of some skin or systemic abnormality? So when you have a patient with CVG, cutis vertices gyrata, you need to set aside some time to do a good history to figure out if there's underlying disorders that are predisposing. And what this study tells us is that dissecting cellulitis can sometimes be the reason that some patients are developing these folds and furrows in the scalp. And the study also encourages us to not only take good histories and examine the scalp and perform trichoscopy and perform pull tests and perform pluck tests. But I think this study reminds us that putting pressure on the skin and manipulating tissues is really important to understand laxity. And in this case, there are some patients with dissecting cellulitis that have this extreme hypermobility. And in some cases, this may be a clue to... Um, the dissecting cellulitis, and it may be a clue to um, some hypermobility that's existing. We don't fully understand how to treat or address these different variants, um, but certainly in patients with dissecting cellulitis, the uh, treatment of the dissecting cellulitis will be important. Um, in very localized areas, we may look to standard treatments of the dissecting cellulitis, including antibiotics and isotretinoin. But in patients with very localized dissecting cellulitis associated with these CVG changes, there are many patients that respond really well to uh, steroid injections and topical steroids um, and close monitoring, sometimes reducing inflammation with uh, antimicrobial washes, reducing inflammation with short-term use of topical antibiotics, the use of generous use of anti-dandruff shampoos can be really important in, in these very localized forms. But I really like this study. It was it's a, a brilliant study that really addresses these new variants of dissecting cellulitis, and I am absolutely confident that these are more common than we realize. And so um I'll be on the watch for them, and I thank these authors for these very, very nice studies. So that's it for this week. To recap, we've talked about the risk of hair loss in patients with scarring alopecia, a really nice study by Flanagan and colleagues, teaching us that 8% of patients with scarring alopecia have hair loss. And for half of them, it's mild, but for half of them, it's moderate to severe. So there are some patients out there that are going through really tough times with hair loss after vaccines. If it was a one-time thing, it would be a different story, but this may be yearly. 
And so if we have 8% of our patients shedding for half of the year after receiving their vaccine, this is going to be an issue. And what do we do with this information? I think that's really the long-term question. The second long-term question is, does everyone get their hair back? I think we're of the mindset now that, of course, people get their hair back. You shed, you get your hair back. I don't think we know that. We need the studies to prove it. And it, it may be that some patients don't get their hair back. I think we're of the same mindset with COVID infection, that patients shed and they get their hair back. As I reviewed on the podcast last week, there is reason to believe that there are many different presentations of COVID-related hair loss. And maybe due to the scarring that develops in some patients, and maybe due to these changes in nerves, that there is a group of patients. I don't know if it's 1% or 0.01% or 0.001% that don't get their hair back and have chronic symptoms. We need, we need long-term studies. But I think we just need to be humble to the fact that COVID in it surprises us continuously. And so do vaccines. And so... I just think we need more study of this. And certainly vaccines have been very, very important to reduce the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19. And I think for many of these patients, ongoing receipt of vaccines is going to be important. But I think we need to understand what are the factors that give these side effects and how can we help patients reduce their chances of shedding. A really nice study in JAD looked at the progression from DLE to SLE there are three factors that are really important that predict the chance a patient with discoid lupus will go on to systemic lupus. That is age less than 25, an ANA of 1 in 320 or more, and darker colored skin. And if you have all three, you have a 50% chance of going on to severe SLE forms. I think that's really important. And really one of the most important features is a positive ANA of 1 in 320 or more. But all three of these are, are helpful. We talked about the incredibly close association between folliculitis decalvans and dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. This is a really fascinating study. Folliculitis decalvans is not common in the world. Certainly, I see lots of patients with folliculitis decalvans. You probably do too. But overall, about one out of every 15,000 patients in the world, maybe one in 20,000, develop folliculitis decalvans but it's as low as or high as one in four in patients with dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. That's a really incredible risk. And so how do we reduce the risk that patients with dystrophic EB go on to develop folliculitis decalvans? How can we alter the skin microbiome? I think this is fascinating information. I think this is probably the patient population where this can be studied the best. And it may be possible to put together understanding of skin microbiome research, wound care research, and hair care to really understand how we can reduce the risk. And it's these EB centers, it's these centers that study epidermolysis bullosa and have the patient numbers where this can be studied. And I thank the authors for this really, really nice paper. We talked about Dissecting cellulitis forming in the donor area after hair transplantation. And we add dissecting cellulitis to the list of things that can go wrong after a hair transplant. Fortunately, most patients do great after hair transplants. But I think we need to be open to the possibility that LPP can develop in the donor area. Chronic pain syndromes can develop in the donor area. Folliculitis can develop in the donor area. And dissecting cellulitis can develop in the donor area after transplant. And I thank the authors for this really nice study. And we talked about four new dissecting cellulitis variants that mimic CVG, that have folds and furrows and gyri. And I think this forces us to keep an open mind about um, CVG and the CVG-like presentations that can occur in dissecting cellulitis and certainly encourages us to consider adding gentle pressure to, to our scalp examinations as we understand the folds and the furrows. These indentations occur because of loss of tissue, loss of ground substance, loss of collagen and elastin, 
but they can also occur because of sinus tracts and they can also occur because of loss of hair follicles. And so I think that test and the ability to elicit a positive fold sign or a positive jacket sign is helpful because it provides information about what could be going on there in the scalp. But there are these variants of dissecting cellulitis associated with folds. Either folds that are there when you walk into the room or folds that can be elicited when you put pressure on the scalp. And I really like this study and I thank the authors for this very helpful study. That's it for this week. Next week, we're back for the fourth Monday of the month of March. That'll be the sixth episode of the season, and we'll be talking about a wide variety of studies that have been published in the last month or two. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the comments that come in. I look forward to speaking to you next week. Thanks so much for joining me for this week. Bye for now.